before you leave the room. All right. Well, it's six o'clock. Let's call the meeting to order. Special meeting of the Sawyer County Board of Supervisors. Uh, I guess, uh, do we have the roll call? Dale Schleter? Here. Jesse Betcher? Jesse Betcher? Tweed Schumann? Hey, Jesse's Stacey here. Sorry Hessel? About that. Okay, Jesse's here. Stacy Hessel? Here. James Schlender? Mark Helwig? Here. Thomas Duffy? Here. Bruce Paulson? Here. Brian Bizanet? Chuck Van Etten? Here. Dale Olson? Here. Don Pettit? Ron Kinsley? Here. Ron Buckholtz? Present. Ed Peters? Here. Okay, we do have an agenda. Has this meeting been formally published? This, this meeting has been noticed to the members of the board, the public, and the news media as required by section 19.84 of the Wisconsin statutes. Okay, let's please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> the Pledge, of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Tom, you want to start us off? Mm -hmm. Okay, please. I guess, yeah, well, thank you. Um, we're uh, fortunate to have two very knowledgeable individuals in our presence, besides all of you, of course. Um, Sarah from WCA and Andy Phillips, uh, legal counsel for WCA and uh, Von Breesen. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Sarah. They have a presentation, and I don't know what, what your format is, if you at, want them to ask questions as you go along or whatever, but uh, you can have the floor and take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, as Tom said, I'm Sarah Deidre Kasdorf. I'm the Deputy Director of Government Affairs at the Wisconsin Counties Association. I've been with the association for almost 30 years now, so I have seen a lot in my time um, and across many... Uh, Many different issues, many county boards. I've worked on a lot of different issues at the association. I currently, um, you know, focus my legislative efforts on issues related to health and human services. I don't know, Andy, do you want to give a brief hello? Sorry, I was on mute. I, you know, I don't know if there's much I can add to Tom's incredibly verbose introduction. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> I've been I've been a lawyer for 26 years now, and I so Sarah, that means that you've been at the association for just a couple more years, and I've been uh, representing the association. So between the two of us, I think we've got quite a bit of experience working with counties all across the state, and it's it's a lot of fun. Yes, it's it's been a treat, Andy, working with you over the last 26 years. That's for sure. I uh, we do have one picture of you from your early years floating around the office. I will never pull that out or identify where that is because of my fear that somebody could do the same to me. And <laughs> we do you. not want to it. see, we don't want to see what I look like uh, 30 years ago, much, much different. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to, to join you today. Um, we're gonna talk to you about four, four bigger categories of issues, starting with roles and responsibilities, then moving on to um, parliamentary procedure, open meetings law, and then we're going to talk a little bit about ethics and conflict of interest. We have two hours in which to get this done. Um, you know, we could talk probably about each of these issues for 45 minutes to an hour or more in and of themselves. I promise you we will not do that tonight. We know you guys would like to get out of here at on time at eight o'clock, so we are going to be very mindful of the time, uh, watching, you know, to make sure that we leave enough time. I know I had a conversation with the board chair on my way up here uh, this afternoon, and he had indicated the way he wanted to proceed on this is after each major section, we'd see if there were one or two burning questions that folks had. And then after that, in the interest of time, we would move on to the rest of our presentation. And then if folks had questions, they could email them to me or to Andy, and then we would do a written response and send it out to the full board 
um, you know, as, as we anticipate that if one person has a question, probably others have the same question as well. So we just want to make sure that we're mindful of the time, yet making sure that we are getting everybody's questions answered. So moving forward, I'm going to start on the roles and responsibilities piece, and then Andy is going to go from there. And you're going to see me checking my notes here, simply because I don't want to go too far off tangent given the time constraints that we have. So I'm going to try to stick to the script as much as possible uh, today um, so that we can, we can get everything covered that we need to cover. So in terms of county authority and where counties get their authority, that comes from chapter 59 of the state statutes. That's where you will find all the information related to such things as county governance structures, um, the county board, uh, powers and duties of counties. You'll find uh, the powers and duties of your county officers as well located in chapter 59. Um, chapter 59 also identifies and, and tries to define a county and defines a, a, a county as a body corporate that can sue and that can also be sued. Um, other powers um, that counties have though, um, aren't, our powers aren't absolute. And there are some limits within state statute to what a county can and cannot do. Um, you know, for example, counties do not have constitutional home rule authority like cities do. That means that counties cannot undertake any action unless it is expressly allowed by statute as compared to a city that can undertake any action as long as it is not prohibited by statute. I'm sure, you know, that, that is my, the most simplest way that, that I can think of to explain, um, you know, how home rule authority works and the difference between counties and the difference between cities. Now we do have administrative home rule. I think I'm gonna talk about that though in the next slide. Um, but again, according to chapter 59, counties are governed by a board of supervisors. There is language in the statute that does put a maximum limit with regard to the number of county uh, supervisors that can sit on a board Based off, of, um, based off of your county's population. That being said, there is not a single county at that maximum level. Um, I think many years ago, we probably had a number of counties at the maximum level, but over the years, we tend to see counties decrease in, in its board size. Today, our county board sizes range from seven to 38. If you're wondering what county is at seven and what one's at 38, Menominee County is at seven and Marathon County has 38 supervisors. There we go. All right, so looking at um, chapter 59 of the statutes and let's talk about administrative home rule and how the statutes deal with that. So until the mid 1980s, counties did not have any authority over their own administrative structures. At that time, county said it really doesn't make sense for us to not have some sort of autonomy or authority over how it is we structure ourselves administratively. So in the mid 80s, counties went to the state legislature later to obtain what is known as administrative home rule. And that means that according to the statute, every county may exercise any organizational or administrative power subject only to the constitution and to any enactment of the legislature, which is of statewide concern and which uniformly affects every county. Now this uh, administrative home rule authority is not without its own limitations. Uh, for example, back in 2010, Ozaki County asked the Attorney General for an opinion as to whether or not their county administrator could, uh, could cede his um, appointment authority to boards and commissions to the county board, in particular the county board chair. Uh, the Attorney General at the time opined that the county administrator did not have the authority to do so. So again, while we do have administrative home rule authority, there are some limitations to that in, in, as well. So counties are required to have one of three types of, of county government. Uh, those three types are a county executive form of government, a county administrator form of government, or you could have a county administrative coordinator. Um, right now, there are 12 counties that we know have county executives. Um, with regard to the number of counties with county administrators and county administrative coordinators, I think that number is ever changing. So I actually think the 27 in the slide might now be 28 and the 33 might be 32. I need to update that um, because I know I think some counties are 
have recently decided with certain retirements to move to a county administrator from the administrative coordinator form of government. So these numbers are, again, seem to always be, always be changing. What I'm gonna do next is real quickly talk about the three different forms of county government. I'm gonna keep getting that pop-up, I think. All right, so first let's talk about, oops, one too far. Let's first talk about the county executive. Uh, the county executive serves as the chief executive officer of the county. Uh, the county executive duties are outlined in uh, WISTAT 5917. Uh, the county executive um, appoints and supervises department heads subject to board confirmation, appoints members to boards and commissions, submits an annual budget for the county board to consider. Um, you know, the, the, the county executive also has veto authority, which means that the county executive can veto such things as any ordinance or uh, resolution that the county board has, has adopted. Um, the, 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 the county exec also can utilize some partial veto authority as well with regard to the county budget. However, the county board does have the ability to override a veto of the county executive by a two thirds vote. Probably the form of government that you guys are probably most interested in would be the county administrator form of government. Um, the county administrator is appointed by a majority of the county board and serves as the chief administrative officer of the county. They are responsible for coordinating all administrative and management functions not vested by law with other officers. Again, similar, you'll see the duties tend to be very similar to the county executive a function and that they appoint and supervise department heads. They appoint members to boards and commissions. The county administrator submits an annual budget. The two biggest differences between a county executive and a county administrator is that the uh, county administrator answers to the county board of supervisors, whereas the county executive answers to the public and the county executive has veto authority, which the county administrator does not. So the administrative coordinator, those statutes um, or those duties are listed under WISTAT 5919. Um, under the county administrator form of government or the administrative coordinator form, the administrative coordinator shall be responsible for coordinating all administrative and management functions of the county government, not otherwise vested by law in boards or commissions or in other elected officers. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's very similar to a county administrator position, but they do not have the appointment authority for boards and commissions and department heads like the uh, county administrator does. And um, the and it's different in the sense that there are many uh, different options that counties can, can look to in terms of appointing an administrative coordinator. So if a county does not have a county exec or a county administrator, county needs to appoint an administrative coordinator looks different depending upon what county you're in. Some counties will hire a full-time administrative coordinator. Some counties, other counties will appoint their county clerk or one county has appointed their IT director to serve as the administrative coordinator. Somebody has to have that title at a minimum in every county. So talking about the County Board of Supervisors, um, the County Board of Supervisors, you know, serves primarily a legislative function. And that function is, is it's really limited to policy making and lawmaking. And you do that through the adoption of ordinances. You do that through the adoption of resolutions. You do that through the adoption of your annual budget. Um, and you guys really, as a board, um, you, you, you really need to strive to work on cooperative decision making. Um, you know, Can I inter no inter interrupt for a second? I just want to acknowledge that I'm here and I am just fascinated that the lecture going on. Just thank you. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I just got here as well. All right. And hello to James. I think we sat briefly together on the Access to Justice Commission. So hello to you. Um, so the, the point here under the County Board of Supervisors, the last point on here, is that no operational control resides with any individual county supervisor. So in terms of the functions of a county board, you know, the county board really works hard 
and should work hard to involve, represent, and be accountable to the public as you as board members are elected by members of the public. As a board, you determine what services are provided uh, within your county. You as a board also adopt your budget, and in so doing, you have the authority to levy taxes to pay for the services that you are opting to provide. And by opting to provide, I should say sometimes you opt to provide, sometimes the state mandates that you provide these services. Um, you also have the ability you know, to regulate within statutory authority. If we were to, to really you know, narrow this down to two words, the county board really functions to, to enact policy. All right, the county board chair. Um, with stat 5912 does talk about the county board chair and the roles of the county board chair statutorily you know the, the the statute talks about how the county board chair presides over the meetings of the county board of supervisors the county board chair administers oaths counter signs ordinances um you know can if if the county doesn't have another process or procedure in place the the statute does designate that it is the county board chair that would appoint committee members subject to board confirmation but then there are other things too that aren't listed in the statute that are really important functions of the county board chair. And those include such things as, you know, serving as the spokesperson for the county board, providing guidance and direction on how issues would move through the county board as well. Again, you'll see that board chair taking on a leadership role on behalf of the board. In terms of county board supervisors, supervise, a county board supervisor's authority is is, is collective versus individual. Really what that means is that no individual county board supervisor has the authority to act on behalf of the board unless they are authorized by the board to do so. When a county board supervisor is appointed to the role of committee chair, then that supervisor has a little bit more authority to do such things as to set the agenda for that committee, um, to preside at those committee meetings, make reports and recommendations on behalf of that committee. Um, what we find really interesting is the fact that you guys as board members are referred to as county supervisors. Now, one could really argue that the legislature made a big mistake in calling you guys county board supervisors because in essence, do you really supervise anything as a county board? Exactly. Yep, exactly. See, you guys got it. You're good. <laughs> yep, no micromanaging. You got it. You got it. Andy, we can stop here. We're good. <laughs> so just real quickly, in terms of the board's roles and responsibilities, again, we talked about this in terms of the board adopting policy, holding staff accountable, making sure that the policies that the board has, has uh, adopted are being implemented um, at the county level. Um, really, your, your role as a board is to be that of a visionary. You guys as a board, you wanna think about things in terms of long-term. You wanna think about things in terms of strategic planning. You really wanna reach out. You wanna to talk to your citizens and find out what services is it that, 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 your, that your citizens desire the county to offer. Um, you know, so again, you guys are really doing, you guys are, you're doing the big lifting in the sense that you guys are doing all the heavy thinking and really guiding the county and the direction in which it, it should go. So in terms of staff roles and responsibilities, um, you know, county board supervisors and department heads really have vastly different um, responsibilities. Again, supervisors uh, serve in a uh, primary legislative role, staff serve in an operational and an advisory role, meaning staff has an obligation to carry out the duties in a manner consistent with um, policy set by the board. Uh, you can, however, though, ask your, your, your department heads, and you probably should ask your department heads for advice and recommendations, uh, you know, with regard to, you know, what, what direction that you think, um, you know, might be good for, for your county to go in. Um, but again, your, your staff does not make policy other than internal policy related to their departments as, as authorized again by the board. Again, again, a lot of this is a bit repetitive. Your terms of administration, your department heads and staff implement policies and strategies. While we talked about how you as a board need to think about things long-term, strategic planning, 
your, your uh, department heads, your administrators need to take a look at things in shorter term in terms of how is it do we implement policies on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're looking at some smaller functions. They're really addressing the needs of the department um, and, and taking care of individual issues, which means that you want your staff to really pay attention to detail, and sometimes that requires some specialized training by your staff. So real quickly, um, if we take a look at, at you know, what, is, what it is you guys might desire in terms of hiring your staff, compared to what qualifications are needed to serve on the board. So when you guys are hiring staff, you want to hire the best and the brightest, which means when you're hiring staff, you're gonna look for somebody that's educated, that has experience, you know, that, that can pass a background check, is bonded, you know, they, they belong to all the professional associations, all their licenses are up to date, all of that, right? So if you're gonna hire, say for example, a highway commissioner, you might want to look for someone who's a civil engineer who has some experience working in the highway department. You know, that's somebody that has a solid, solid background. You don't just advertise for a breathing person to come in and serve as your highway commissioner, right? Now, I laugh when I say that because my daughter, just, just to go on one, one tangent here, my daughter applied for several jobs on the Sunday of her spring break. So it's like, you know, a week ago Sunday, got hired for a job on, on, uh, on Saturday. So six days later, got a job. But, and she's 16, almost 17. And one of the places she wanted to work was Dick's Sporting Goods. She's a big athlete, loves, you know, loves sports, has played team sports since she was four years old. Um, you know, she, you know, loves tennis shoes. So she likes to go there all the time and buy new shoes. So it's a perfect place for her to work. She went on an Indeed. She applied for all these jobs online, looked at Indeed, and basically what it said on Indeed was, as long as you're breathing, you will be able to get a job at Dick Sporting Goods. So, so when I say a breathing person, I mean that for counties, maybe not so much for Dick Sporting Goods, you know? But, but I found that funny as I was reviewing the notes from the slide and saying, gosh, do I really say that? Because you know, that's exactly how my daughter got her job. But, but anyway, but, but for county board members, what are, the, you know, what are the criteria for serving on a county board? You need to be, what, 18 years of age, not a felon, and you need to live in your district. To serve on the board, you need to get elected, right? Which means you need to know a lot of people, have a lot of good connections, right? Um, did I say in there you need to be the best and brightest? I'm not saying you guys aren't. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong there. Because there are lots of great, bright, wonderful people that serve in our county boards across the state. But you can see there that there is a difference with regard to what you might be looking for when you're hiring staff and why it is you want to do that. And that's of course because what it is that you are asking your, your staff to do. When looking at this in terms of policy and boards versus the difference between your administrative operations or your staff, the questions you might ask yourself when you're making policy is what, and what, what do we need to do and why should we do it? In terms of your, your administrators, they may be asking the questions, how are we gonna do it? When are we gonna do it? Where are we going to do it? Just as a quick example here, um, you know, on the policy side, the things you as a board would consider, will sh or should we as a board establish a hiking trail system? Why? Will it be beneficial to the county? Do the people want it? You know, in terms of the administrative options, once you guys make that policy decision, then the staff begins to ask the, you know, the how, when, and where. Who's gonna build it and who's gonna maintain it? When is it going to, you know, when are we going to open it? What's the time frame for implementation? And where will the system need to be maintained? So real quick on what the courts have said with regard to, you know, policy versus administration. Um, until a Milwaukee County court case a few years ago, and that's very specific to Milwaukee, so it doesn't necessarily apply. There has been one published decision on the distinction between policymaking and administration. This was a case out of Outagamie County where the county board decided that it wanted to lease land uh, near the airport to a farmer. Again, a policy decision, right? Well, the county executive did not agree with that decision, thought it was too dangerous to lease land to a farmer because it was too close to the airport, even though the FAA and the county board made its policy decision, raised no issues or concerns with it. So, um, so that case ended up going to court. 
And in its ruling, the court looked at a number of things, including, including prior attorney general positions. It took a look at the, uh, at a, a, the dictionary definition of policy and administration. And here's what the court said in that case. The court said the county board's function is primarily policy making and legislative, while the county executive functions as an administrator and manager. Policy has been defined as a high level overall plan, embracing the general goals and acceptable procedures, especially of a governing body. And again, they pulled that definition specifically from, uh, from the dictionary. The court then went on to say that legislative power is distinguished from executive power is the authority to make laws, but not to enforce them or appoint the agents charged with the duty of such enforcement. The crucial test for determining what is legislative and what is administrative has been said to be whether the ordinance is one making a new law or one executing a law already in existence. Now I know this was a little, this court case is a little different because it, it does talk about the distinction between a county uh, you know, executive versus the board. But at the same time, I think what the court says in terms of the policy making role versus the, um, you know, the, the enforcement function, I think that the court does a really good job here of, of explaining exactly what, what the difference is and the distinction is. In terms of leadership roles, um, county department heads have to play a leadership role within their departments, within the guidelines and the pol based on the policies and procedures that were set by the board. And then they may be clarified as well through directives from the executive or administrator. Um, again, individual county board supervisors you know, have no management or leadership role outside of committees and commissions. Again, as we talked about earlier, your authority is collective as a member of the board. In terms of what happens when we have, um, you know, without distinction between policy and administration, well, you can spend a lot of time as a board discussing trivial matters as opposed to discussing big picture items. You can also spend a lot of time reading documents, trying to find out all the specifics and learning the details about things. Um, you know, it can end up with, you know, policymakers meddling in the administration. But one of the things it really does is, is this, this concept of reactivity versus proactivity, meaning, again, getting back to the whole concept of you guys, are you going to be reacting to things or are you guys going to be proactive, creating that strategic plan, setting that future vision for, for your county? Okay, county board committees, real quickly here. Again, according to the statutes, the county board can, by resolution, uh, you know, create create committees, you know, again, every county does that right after the, right after the elections, every county talks about what its committee structure is gonna look like, typically adopts that in the form of their county board rules. In terms of the standing committee functions, standing committees do provide policy oversight for departments, offices, and other entities. You might monitor the performance of a uh, particular department to make sure that that department is working in compliance with the policies that have been set by the board. Uh, as a standing committee member, you may also review and make budget recommendations, draft ordinances and resolutions. Again, as a, as a member of a committee, you're, you're still working in that policy development role. Again, as, as you guys all know, the way it works in, at the county level is our uh, counties are really structured in the state of Wisconsin so that the committees do much of that preliminary work. And then as a committee, you then will make a recommendation to the full board. A lot of times you put people on your committees that have a knowledge about certain issues under which that, that committee has, has uh, some authority over. Um, you know, and you also know as, as a committee member who, who it is in the, uh, in the community you may need to reach out to as well to determine what the needs are of the members of the community to help you in developing, again, your long-term uh, planning. Again, this last slide that I'm going to talk about before I turn it over to Andy is really just a, uh, a, you know, a typical organizational chart for a county without a county executive. And I always like to start from the bottom, work my way up to the top, that you have your county staff, which is, of course, accountable to their individual department heads. The department heads then are accountable to the administrator, who is accountable to the county board. And with that, Andy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And you turned it over right at the most confusing slide here. Can anybody, anybody make heads or tails about where constitutional officers fall on that organizational chart? Because it was a very pretty chart, 
nice and organized. It was symmetrical. There were all sorts of easy things to follow on the chart and the slide before this. And then we throw in constitutional officers. Where do they fall on the county organizational chart? Um, can anybody name the, or, the constitutional officers we have in city government? And silence is the right answer. There are none. So, I mean, we're, as counties, we always get the fun stuff. We get the unique stuff, the strange stuff. So we get to deal with constitutional officers. That doesn't mean that they don't belong in the organizational chart. But what I have seen several counties struggle with is where they belong on that org chart. And what's the form and function of a constitutional office? Next slide. So when we look at Article 6, Section 4, Article 7, Section 12 of the Wisconsin Constitution, it tells us that as counties, we have these elected constitutional officers. So we know they're there. Article 6, Article 7, Chapter 59, none of those provisions, statutory or constitutional, tell us exactly how we're supposed to relate to as a county board or as county administration to those constitutional officers. But I think that there is plenty that we can infer from the organi organizational structure of counties and the role of those constitutional officers that allow us to have some sort of understanding about where they fit. Next slide, Sarah. So we like to call it the dual persona of the constitutional officer. They're not really a department head, um, but we're asking them to do things like a department head does. Do we have the ability to remove a constitutional officer? Because after all, that's how we create accountability. Sarah talked about concepts of accountability as it relates to administration. We know that Tom, as the administrator, is accountable to the county board. We know that all of the department heads are accountable to Tom. We know that all county staff are accountable to the department head. Who are constitutional officers accountable to it? Well, we know that they're accountable to the electorate. The electorate put them in office. The electorate can take them out of office. In certain circumstances, certain constitutional officers are accountable to the board to go through a removal process, but that's an ugly process. It's, it's difficult. Um, it's called the Chapter 17 Removal for Cause process. It's not easy. Um, so are constitutional officers really accountable to the county board or to the administrator? Well, we happen to think that they are. And I think that it's entirely appropriate to ask constitutional officers to act like the rest of our department heads. The rest, of our, um, the rest of our management staff, if you will. And I think for the most part, based on my discussions with county boards, administrators, executives, administrative coordinators, and constitutional officers all around the state, I think most of them would say, yes, put that responsibility on me. I have a responsibility for my office and my office includes people. Put me in charge of these people and let me perform similar to what a department head does. So, the reason that this is confusing and the reason that this isn't simple is because the statutes and the Constitution don't make it easier simple. But there is a way to make it easier and simpler, and that is to sit down with the constitutional officers and have that discussion. Have that discussion at the outset. What are the expectations as it relates to being a constitutional officer? I'm going to ask a question here, and I don't know that I expect an answer. I'm going to ask a question. For the constitutional officers that are in attendance tonight, and we've got a whole board full of constitutional officers. We've got, I think, a county clerk. I don't know if we have anybody else. How many of you received a job description when you took out papers to run for office? Sarah, how many hands are in the air? I don't see any, Andy. None. So what was the expectation coming in on the very first day that you sat in the seat as a board supervisor, as a constitutional officer? What were the expectations? Do we know? Is it easy to figure out? Is it in the statute? Is it somewhere that says, on your first day, this is exactly what you're going to do? No, it's not there. So what you're gonna hear as a repeating theme throughout this presentation is that laying the foundation, establishing the framework by which you create the opportunity for people to succeed is so incredibly important. So I encourage you, take a look at things like job description, take a look at things like setting up orientation sessions that are incredibly meaningful to establish a dialogue between board and constitutional officers and do those things that are going to, again, establish that foundation for success. Next slide. 
So we've got a series of slides here that talk about working together as a goal. And this is where we get into the touchy feely part of the presentation. And all of you know that I am all about touchy and I'm all about feely. It's awesome. It's great. And of course, I'm kidding. A lot of this stuff is reminders that some of you are probably saying, I don't need a reminder about this. This is obvious. But the reason we put this at the end of this discussion is because everything that comes before this, if we follow everything that comes before this, it's pretty easy to get to this spot on this slide where we are working together as a goal, all right? We're achieving that goal. And so it's important to highlight here, and you'll see in here when we talk about what it means to work together, you'll see the areas in the pitfalls where if you don't do all of the other things to again establish that foundation, you're gonna have a challenge working together as a goal. So, number one, let's know our role. That's why Sarah and I are having a discussion with you tonight, is to understand roles and responsibilities. The more we can get arguments and debates and discussions about whose job it is off the table, we can get back to the real business of Sawyer County government. And that's what the citizens, that's what the residents, that's what the taxpayers put us in these seats to do, is to make the important decisions for Sawyer County. So we have to know our job and we have to know when we know our job, we know that we're not going to interfere with others doing their job. Now, Sarah talked a lot about the role of the board in this entire process. And I just want to reiterate one, one point, and that is the role of the board is twofold. Number one, to make informed decisions regarding policy. And number two, hold the individuals that are responsible for implementation of that policy accountable. As far as I'm concerned, the board really has one employee. That employee is Tom Hoff. And Tom is the one that is consistently on the hot seat. If you got a problem with a particular department, you address Tom. If you got a problem with a department head, you address Tom, all right? It's Tom's job to figure out how to solve that problem, not the board. You're not a super personnel committee trying to run around and solve every issue within the county. Put that responsibility on Tom, all right? So again, let's know our roles. Let's not interfere with others' responsibilities. And that'll allow us to get back to the very important business that's confronting Sawyer County. Second, devote the time necessary to do a good job. It's not easy being a county board member. And Sarah, I'm gonna ask for another show of hands. How many people took this job as board supervisor for the paycheck? Every hand's up in this room, Andy. Every single hand is up because you get paid <laughs> King's ransom. For being a county board supervisor, don't you? No, that's nobody, nobody in their right mind took this job for the paycheck. All right. You took the job because you care about the county and you care about the people that you serve. All right. So part of caring and part of doing a really good job is devoting the time necessary to do that good job. Read all of those reports, ask questions in meetings, ask questions to again allow yourself to make informed policy decisions. Number three, it's okay to admit something that you don't know something. That's okay. I don't know how anybody could come into their first county board meeting with all of the knowledge necessary to make an informed decision about a particular policy issue. It's impossible. I've been doing this for 26 years with counties, Sarah close to 30. I, I can't speak for Sarah, but I learn something new about counties every single week that I'm doing this. All right, so there, I can guarantee you that somebody brand new isn't gonna be able to know everything necessary to be a good county board member. So it's okay to admit that you don't know something and that's, there's a certain freedom in that as well. Don't jump to conclusions here and weigh all the facts. The staff is paid to give you the information necessary to make a good decision. So allow them to do their job. Listen to what they have to say here and weigh all sides of a particular debate or question. Next slide. Don't make promises outside of board meetings. Just like with staff, listen to your constitutional officers. Also listen to your employees. Let them know you're listening, again, within the context of a board meeting. Next slide, Sarah. Don't become a complaint department. I always like to tell county board members that they should have the best Rolodex ever sitting right next to their phone. Because when somebody calls or the particular issue or a problem, that's your opportunity to be a shepherd, to take that person to the individual that can solve the problem. And it's not 
you, all right? The constituents are going to value the opportunity to interface with you to get to the person who can make a difference in the issue that they're confronting or, or facing. But it doesn't mean that you need to roll up your sleeves and go figure out the problem yourself. Remember that you act as a collective body as a board. We don't act as individual supervisors with independent rights from that of the board. We act as a collective whole. So in that situation, in that context, let's endeavor, let's really try to have that awesome Rolodex next to the phone and be that shepherd for the citizens that come in with complaints or issues. Next slide, Sarah. All right, remember staff has a very important job they should understand politics, but they should not take political positions. They should remain politically neutral. They are providing professional advice, professional information to allow you to make a decision. So staff should remain political, politically neutral. By the same token, we shouldn't just assume that staff is taking a political position. Let's assume that staff is doing their job in a professional capacity. Next slide. So key points to remember, and I'm gonna to try to wrap this all up because we've run through it pretty quick. Counties are creatures of the state. We can only do what state statute allows us to do. We do have administrative home rule authority in section 5903 of the statutes, but remember that's statutory home rule authority, which is different than municipal home rule, home rule authority, which is in the constitution. So whenever we're talking about doing something as counties, we gotta look for permission in the statutes. Our board, our county board acts as a legislative body. We set policy, approve budgets, and we make cooperative decisions as a body. And you know, one thing I wanna highlight here too, is, is we talk about this whole issue of cooperative decisions, approving budgets, setting policy and things like that. That's a very important function. It's a difficult function. It's challenging. Trying to figure out exactly how initiatives get before the board, how agendas are set, how committee referrals are made, how things get from committee back to the board and how we set our agenda in a way that's meaningful, impactful, strategic. Who fills that role? Who's the head of that legislative body? It's your county board chair, all right? Just like the speaker of the assembly sets the agenda for the assembly in the state. And I can tell you that Speaker Voss spends an incredible amount of time working on strategy agenda and things like that for state government. So too does the county board chair need to act uh, spend a lot of time in order to set that agenda, all right? Now, again, the county board chair doesn't have independent policy-making authority, but the county board chair is responsible for setting the tone for the county board. And as the board chair goes, that's how the board will go. So it's incredibly important, all right? County boards work most effectively when we have a strong committee system. That's because all of the roll up the sleeves hard work happens at the committee level. By the time something gets to the county board floor, it should have been thoroughly vetted. And all of the potential questions that are out there, or at least a vast majority of them, should have been answered, okay? So again, let's lean on our committees to the extent we can. Next slide. Again, individual supervisors have no individual policy-making authority. Administration, your administrator, Tom, and the department heads, they are there to implement the policies that you set. So let them do that. Let's not micromanage them, all right? And I'm not saying you do, I'm not saying you don't. All I'm saying is that based upon my experience, based on Sarah's experience, we've seen issues like this where county boards become very hands-on. And again, there's nothing, you know, evil about that. I think people are just trying to do a good job, but it's from a lack of understanding roles and responsibilities that those county board supervisors are actually defeating their purpose, which is to do a good job, all right? They're not allowing staff to do what staff does best. So again, when we understand roles, when we understand responsibilities, that's when we form a cohesive team and we build on success. Next slide. So there are some resources. This is the end of the roles and responsibilities part of this. Sarah, we ran through this in 45 minutes, which I think is a land speed record for this presentation, to be honest. Um, are we pausing and asking for any questions on this so somebody can debate you or me on this? That's typically what happens. Nope, I think we're good, Andy. Wow, I love it. So Sarah, are you gonna kick us off on effective meetings? I will kick us off in effective meetings. 
I'm, I'm really shocked though. I like it when people try to nail Andy with questions and nobody had anything. You're ruining my fun tonight. <laughs> you know, it's okay, I, maybe in a maybe I, later on in the presentation we can ask him something. I ask actually him something have a couple of questions. Oh, yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Olson. Yeah, I got a, just a couple of notes that I jotted down here. Um, you know what? I, I absolutely agree with Sarah that knowledge of a committee, you know, having a background knowledge of what that committee does is super important. Where does legal counsel fit in in all of these flow charts and, and graphs we had? Legal counsel is there to assist the county with whatever decisions it's making. And so it depends upon the nature of those decisions. Do you have to have legal counsel tell you how to how to cross a T? No, you don't need legal counsel for that. But if you're talking about implementation of an ordinance and an enforcement mechanism for that ordinance, that's where legal counsel comes in and gives advice there. So it really depends upon the nature of the business that's being undertaken by a committee or by the county board as to when legal counsel comes in. Okay, that's great. I, I also have a couple of other things. You know, one of the statements you made was don't interfere with the administration and the administrator. And the other one was uh, constitutional officers are responsible to the administrator. And I guess I just couldn't disagree more. Not that I have any legal background, but, uh, you know, they're elected officials, the same as I am. And uh, they certainly shouldn't be responsible there. Well, and, and perhaps I don't recall exactly what I said, Supervisor Olson, about that point. What I meant was this, is that of course the administrator does not have the opportunity to remove a constitutional officer from office. So from that standpoint, there is no ultimate accountability. However, the administrator is responsible for implementation of the county board's budget. All right, and so if a constitutional officer is going completely out of line on the budget, whose problem is that? Well, it's the administrator's problem and the constitutional officer's problem. So I think there's opportunity there for the administrator to have a discussion with constitutional officer and say, here are the expectations as it relates to budget, or for that matter, as it relates to a personnel issue. Because again, the constitutional officer does not have independent authority to just raise taxes and spend money, all of the appropriation comes from the county board. Constitutional officer has no authority to adopt independent personnel policies. That authority comes from the county board. And the administrator, again, implements those policies. So when I talk about accountability, it is different with constitutional officers, but it's not wholly independent. That was my point. And I think... Did we get them all, Mr. Olson, then? Uh, just, just that in that, in that response, you know, while I agree with Andy and I highly respect Andy, you know, we're, we're saying that that's where the rubber meets the road. And uh, so far, what I've heard our duties include is approving hiking trails. Um, I, and I don't think that's the way county boards were meant to be, you know, elected was things like that. So, yeah, and that was you. just an example, perhaps a poor example, but it was an example of a policy decision and then all of the decisions that flow off of that very major policy decision. It was only intended as that point. Um, I think you have a far more important job than simply approving hiking trails. I could not agree more. Right. Okay, I got to go with Mr. Helwig now. He has a question. Uh, we, uh, he was, uh, Dale was talking about uh, some employee things there. I was curious, does the board have any thing they can do as far as hiring and firing of county employees? Or is that all in the uh, administrator's court? Well, it's not all there. I mean, when you talk about the role of the administrator, obviously the administrator is responsible for the day-to-day -day implementation of policies. So when we talk about the board's function as it relates to termination decisions and things like that, a couple of things. Number one, you can have an employee handbook or personnel policies applicable to all employees that speaks to the process related to, for example, termination of the employment relationship. So in other words, instead of just giving Mr. Hoff the, abil the ability to fire people on a, on a moment's notice, you may say in your personnel policies that, you know, the administrator has to confer with the department head and both of them have to agree or 
some process, and I'm making this up, so don't hold me to this. It's not like this is the law. You may have some process in there relating to termination. Second point is that I know you've got a grievance procedure because it was required by law after Act 10. It's 66.0509 sub 1M of the statute. So the county board has to be the ultimate decision maker as it relates to an employee termination because if the employee appeals to the highest level of authority, that's the county board. So I don't think the county board is uninvolved on employee terminations, but I don't think that they are the entity responsible for making every single decision relating to termination, if that makes sense. Okay, yep, thank you, Andy. Okay, we'll go on to running effective meetings, Sarah. All right, I'm gonna to try to do this as quickly as I can so that we can turn the rest of it over to Andy. So I always start out with this little, uh, this little picture. This is from a meeting of the Ukrainian parliament in 2010. So if you look at that picture a little more closely, you can see some guys getting punched in the face, Another guy's got his, someone's grabbing at his sleeve. Somebody else looks like he's going to hit the guy, you know, with this, this plastic bottle of water. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit disconcerting here to see that. Again, from this same meeting, you know, the, the caption reads under this, Ukraine passes deal under hail of eggs. So you can see they're throwing eggs at, at the, the leaders. Um, they have umbrellas trying to save themselves from the eggs. Um, you know, I think this is the type of activity that I think we really hope to avoid on the county board floor. Hopefully this has never happened in Sawyer County. Hopefully this never happens in Sawyer County. Just once, I think. So. Just once? All right, just once. <laughs> you get a pass just one time. Um, but again, I think a lot of these, these types of things, things getting a little bit out of control, don't have to happen if you have good rules and, and, uh, in, in, in place and you follow those, those, those rules. So if we take a look at our, our procedural rules and where is it that the counties get their, their sources of procedural rules, there's really three primary places. First is state statute. And of course, as I think it's pretty obvious, counties must always ensure that they are in, in compliance with state law. And I'll tell you right up front that there are some things that are included in Robert's Rules of Order that are in conflict with state statute. So there are times where you guys may say, as a board, we follow Robert's rules of order. However, there may be something in statute that supersedes that. And so you need to make sure you're always following state statute. In addition to state statute, every county adopts, you know, the, some, some local rules. You know, sometimes they are called, um, you know, county board rules. Sometimes it's called a county handbook. They're called different things depending upon the county you're in. But that's the opportunity for each county to set, in addition to what's in state statute, some additional rules that they think would allow for, um, you know, a, 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 a good, you know, a good and proper meeting to occur. And then finally, there's Robert's Rules of Order. That is the default set of rules for most, if not, I think all counties across the state. So if state statute doesn't address an issue, if your local rule doesn't address an issue, then typically counties will look to Robert's Rules of Order to determine, um, you know, how, how, how an issue would potentially uh, get addressed. One caution though on Robert's Rules of Order, it was not written for government use. So these, what is written in Robert's applies to all different types of meetings. So again, we have to make sure that we are always in compliance with, with state statute when, when taking a look at Robert's Rules. Um, you know, in, in some of the other uh, presentations that we give, you know, on agendas and minutes or other things, for example, there are a lot of times where we'll point out where there is a discrepancy between Robert's rules and, and state statute. But in the interest of time today, let's move forward. Why do we have an object? Uh, why do we have um, you know, rules of order? We have them really according to Robert's rules. Um, you know, it's a set of procedural rules as necessary to facilitate the smooth functioning of an assembly. Rules provide order. They provide a firm basis for resolving questions of procedure and they ensure organizational stability. So this next, this next little, uh, um, this chart here, I actually stole from, I think our, our partners over at uh, the local government center at UW-Madison Division of uh, Extension. Um, 
with regard to, and this makes it real simple and real clear, probably the easiest chart I've seen that talks about, you know, once we get through the opening parts of our county board meeting where you do your roll call, you know, you call to order, all of that type of stuff, then what happens? That's when you get down to business. And there's really eight, eight things that happen within a meeting that gets something from a, a proposal to actually being adopted by the board. And we're gonna really quickly walk through these, these eight steps. The first thing, um, step one, in order for something to get before the floor, get on the floor for consideration, um, you know, a member must obtain the floor. This is done in a number of different ways. Uh, Robert's Rules calls for standing to obtain the floor. Um, I think, uh, you know, we don't see that really so much anymore in, in, a, in, in our county boardrooms. A lot of times, you know, depending upon what type of room you're in, a lot of counties are equipped with, you know, buttons that you push to say you want to. If you've got a smaller county, somebody may just raise their hand to ask to be, you know, recognized uh, by the chair and to obtain the floor. So again, you just work, you know, however, whatever process is used by your county, in order to make a motion, you first need to obtain the floor. And once you obtain the floor, then you are able to, you know, make a motion and participate in debate. Step two, of course, is making of a motion. So in order for business to be brought before the body, um, a motion is necessary. Um, a member makes a motion, which is really a formal proposal by a member in a meeting that the group take some sort of particular action. And it's really a main motion that brings business before the body. You know, a main motion might be, you know, you might, for example, move adoption, you might move indefinite postponement, something like that. Those would be, would be examples of, of main motions. Um, but it is that main motion that, that does bring the business before the body. And according to Robert's rules, there should not be a debate on any subject before a motion has been made. In addition to that, only one main motion should be before the body for action at one time. Now, in order to make a motion, what should somebody say? Typically, you would, it would be as simple as, I move that, and then from there, you want to clearly describe your proposal. What is it that you are asking the body to do? One of the things that Robert's Rules talks about very clearly is not to make negative motions. Sometimes what, what you're really trying to avoid um, is having a no vote mean yes, and a yes vote mean no. And, and that gets really confusing when yeah. people don't exactly quite know what they're talking about. So you really want to make positive motions, not negative motions. Um, sometimes you will be, and this happens more so in a committee than, than what we would see typically in a, uh, you know, in a, um, you know, on, on the board floor per se, but um, you're in a committee meeting, for example, and let's say uh, you guys decide you want to buy a new highway truck. And somebody says, you know, in your committee discussion, yeah, let's buy a new highway truck. I think that'd be a good idea. And somebody else says, well, yeah, but our trucks are always orange, but I think our truck should be yellow now. I like yellow better. And someone says, yeah, yeah, but you know what? But I want to limit how much this, this truck costs. You know, I think we should spend no more than 250000 on it. And someone says, nah, trucks don't cost $250,000. You know, let's, we can get it for $150,000. let us limit it at that. And then somebody says, so moved. Have you ever been in a meeting where that's happened? No. <laughs> and then everybody says, okay, what is it that we just think we are going to be voting on, right? right. So that's why it is really important that you would make a motion to say, I move that, and then you clearly describe what it is that, that you want the body to take action on. Once you make a motion, oops, Someone who's got all these little things in here. So once we make a motion, um, you know, that motion needs to get seconded and it needs to be seconded, of course, by another member. The purpose of that is just to show that at least there are two, two members of the body that want the proposal to be considered. Now, just because you second a motion doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with the motion. It just typically means that, that you think that, that the motion is, is, is worthy of debate and worthy of some additional discussion. Um, you know, according to Robert's rules, a second is needed to advance a, a motion forward. Um, in order to second a motion, it's, it's really, you know, informal. According to Robert's rules, 
You don't even need to be recognized by the chair. You can just call out second or I second the motion and that would suffice. Again, step four in this process, the chair states the question on the motion. And that is really important. So the chair might say something like, it has been moved and seconded that. We are going to buy a highway truck that is going to be yellow and the county should spend no more than $150,000 on that truck. So it's really clear to everybody what it is that, that the proposal, what the proposal is before the body. Um, so again, it's, it is necessary for the motion to be properly before the group for consideration. But the other thing by the chair restating the motion is it takes ownership of that motion and moves it from the maker of the motion to the body, at which point nothing else can happen on that motion until unless the body approves it. And I'll talk about this a little later as well, but that's where we get into this whole friendly amendment thing. And so I'll, uh, there's another slide on that and I'll get to that. But that's where this notion of the motion belonging to the body, um, you know, comes into play most prominently. Um, members debating, that is step five of this process. So we have, um, you know, when the motion is debated, the motion according to Robert's rules then is said to be on the floor. Um, debate really involves discussing the merits of the question. Should we or should we not take this particular action as a body? When debating, typically, according to Robert's rules, again, you would assign the floor first to the maker of the motion to talk about why it is that they, they you know, think their motion should, should be approved. Um, along in debates, no member can speak more than twice, and you cannot speak for more than 10 minutes each time. Um, Roberts also says that a member cannot speak for a second time if somebody who has not yet spoken to that particular motion wishes to speak. Um, I will say, I know there are several counties that do set different time limits with regard to the number of times a person can speak, as well as um, you know, how long a person may speak each time. That's perfectly fine for a county to adopt a county board rule that sets different time limits for speaking. The other thing I'll mention too, because we, we hear this a lot, because you see it on, on you know, watching C-SPAN all the time, if you watch Congress, you know, they all talk about, and I, I'm gonna yield the remainder of my time to somebody else. That's not allowed in Robert's rules. So when you speak to a motion, uh, the remarks must be germane. Uh, the presiding officer, you know, some is, must never interrupt because he or she knows more about the matter than the speaker. If the presiding officer wishes to step down or speak on the motion, the presiding officer must step down if they wish to speak during the debate. Once that, that issue has been voted on and resolved, then the chair can go back and resume their position as chair. Um, the other interesting thing in, in Roberts is that the maker of the motion may vote against their motion, but they are not allowed to speak against his or her own motion. Again, when we're talking about speaking and having decorum in our debate, uh, we must avoid personalities and under no circumstances question the motives of another member. All right, when we talk about uh, amendments, Good. amendments are in order at the time of debate in step number five, only two amendments are, are allowed at a time. Amendments can be used to modify the wording of a particular motion within limits um, and uh, it needs to be very clear, same as your motion needs to be clear, what your amendment, the amendment that you're proposing needs to be very clear as well. You need to specify, you know, what wording change you're seeking, where these words get added, or what words particularly will be, you know, removed from the particular motion. Um, any amendment though must be germane to the, 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 the main motion. In addition to that, or just real quickly, I'm, and I'm going through this really fast, um, you know, there's this concept called the settled rule, meaning if you guys have, a, you know, already taken, you know, voted on a particular amendment, for example, and that amendment gets defeated, you can't come back with, you know, practically the identical motion just by, you know, modifying a little word here or there or saying a instead of the or something like that. You can't come back. It is not appropriate to come back with essentially the same, same amendment, um, you know, and ask the board to, to take that up as well. 
So um, let's see. Well, real quick, Sarah. Yeah. So you say we allow two amendments to the motion and you vote on the first amendment first and, and then the second amendment has to be totally different than just a little word change. The second, well, you can have two amendments on the floor at a time. Okay. Okay. The, the point I was trying to make was you can't have, you can't with the settled rule, for example, say if I make a motion that the truck be yellow and then I say, oh, it should be light yellow, you know, something like that. Again, a really poor example of it, but you're essentially asking the same question twice and that's what needs to be avoided. Okay. Okay. Sure. Mr. Oh, sorry. Yes. When when you're talking about amend, you're saying amendment, but aren't you actually saying like the person would come back and say another motion, say if that was voted down and they came back with another motion? Is that what you're saying? Right. If in essence, an amendment is a motion, you know, it's a, it's a motion to a main motion. And Andy, I'm waiting for the voice of God to come over here on Andy on this one because he's much more knowledgeable on this stuff than I am. But the point is, Andy, are you there? I am here. I am here. You're doing okay. it. Uh, I, I'm not going to chime in when you've got everything right. Okay, just checking. <laughs> yeah, just checking. So there again, two motions on the floor. Um, if there is a motion that, okay, that that is, again, you, you can't, so you have a motion, then you have an amendment to the motion, right? You yeah. act on that motion, right? Yeah. That motion gets defeated. You can't come back with that same something that would basically have the same effect as the motion that was just defeated. So Sarah, you can't keep trying and keep trying and keep let's trying. Here's an idea. County moves to buy a new highway truck. Somebody moves to amend that motion to say it has to be a red highway truck. That amendment gets defeated. Somebody can't make a motion then to say, buy a really red highway truck. Well, it's the same motion that just got defeated, all right? So yeah. in that circumstance, motion to buy a highway truck, move to amend that motion to insert the word red before highway truck. So the motion would read, buy a red highway truck. All right, all in favor of the amendment to the motion say aye. If that motion passes, then the original main motion now says, move to buy a red highway truck, all right? Yeah. So you go down two yeah. steps, you gotta come all the way back up and you take care of all steps along the way. Got it. All right, good. Thank you, Andy. I get so nervous when I talk about this stuff because Andy's the real expert. So I'm just waiting for the voice of God to come down and correct me when I say something wrong. So I'm just waiting Andy, to get to the slide where it's the link <laughs> to the video because I covered everything great in the video. I, I don't trust myself. <laughs> I know I had it right. I know you did. I made you do that. I didn't want to do that one. So I made you do that instead. And the link to the video is in here and we will get to that. So step six of the process is, uh, is really the chair puts the question to the vote. And in order for the chair to do that, the chair really needs to ask the body, are you ready for the question? Is there any further debate? Does anybody wish to discuss this further? The chair should be asking that. And then once the chair has determined that nobody else wishes to speak as part of the debate, then the chair needs to repeat the motion. And then the chair needs to give direction. That means that the chair needs to indicate how many votes are needed for the motion to pass? Is it a simple majority or is a two thirds vote needed? Um, the chair then needs to state the effect of a yes vote. A yes vote means we buy the red truck. A no vote means we do not buy the red truck. And then the chair should indicate how it is you should vote. If you are in favor, vote aye. If you are opposed, you should vote no. Again, this is the, 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 the biggest mistake we see oftentimes, and I just got a question about this a week and a half ago from a county where they were at a meeting and they, uh, and somebody called the question. So if somebody says in the middle of your debate, I call the question, what happens? What does that mean? Well, everybody thinks it ends the discussion, right? But according to Robert's rules, a single individual does not have the authority to determine that the debate should be over. 
So the proper motion to end debate would say would be to say I move the previous question. So instead of saying I call the question, you would move the previous question and then the body would vote unless you know the chair asked for unanimous consent on it, but otherwise the body would vote to determine whether or not the body wishes to cut off debate. Uh, the other thing Robert's rule says is that the presiding officer does not have the authority to end the debate on his or her own. So after we end the debate, we uh, members take a vote. Votes happen in a variety of different ways at the county level. You know, you can do a voice vote, a roll call. A lot of counties have the push button systems now that they use to vote. Um, but whenever, if you are doing a vote, you need to make sure if you are doing a, a voice vote, for example, that you ask for votes on both sides. So the chair needs to ask all those in favor, all those opposed. According to Robert's rules, there is no need to ask how many are abstaining from this. You don't need to call that. That is not necessary according to Robert's rules. Well, then that's real question? quickly yeah. to jump in. Yep. Mentions. I know that Sawyer County, because I've talked to Rebecca about this issue. I know that Sawyer County has a rule on the books, and this is fine because what Sarah said before, when we talk about the order of precedence, Robert's rules at the bottom. You have the ability as a county to establish your own rules that supersede Robert's rules and Roberts recognizes that, and that's okay. I understand that the county board has a rule on the books that says if you're going to abstain, you need to announce that fact before the vote is taken and ask the chair for permission to abstain or otherwise identify the conflict which causes you to not be able to vote on a particular measure. I think that's a good rule. I think it makes a ton of sense because what you want to do is identify if anybody is going to be ineligible to vote. And that way you need to count up to make sure you got a quorum otherwise and you do a <coughs> conflict or ethics issues in advance. So again, if you're going to abstain, that's okay. Just identify that fact before the vote is taken and ask the chair for permission because for re reasons unrelated to Robert's rules, it's a good practice to get into. Okay, thanks, Andy. All right. Okay, so once you voted, then the presiding officer announces the result, whether the motion carried or the motion failed, the chair would state the number of votes on each side and then talk about the effect of the motion. You know, the, the, the motion was adopted, the motion failed. All right, so that was real quick on the procedure part. We're gonna talk about rules of decorum. I'm taking a look at the time. I think I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes on this so that we have enough time for Andy to get through um, the rest of the presentation. Yeah, Sarah, real quick. Um, if the A's and the no's are really close <clears throat> and say, I call for a roll call vote, can a supervisor call for a roll call vote because it's too close to call? Yes. Yeah, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, the answer to that is yeah, yes. Good, because I allow Somebody that. can call for a roll yep. call vote. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Kinsley. I have one question regarding, you said anybody can say second. Does that second need to be recorded in the minutes who made it? Yes, now yeah. that's that's one of the places. The question, Andy, I don't know if you heard it, was whether or not the yeah. second needs to be recorded in the minutes. That is one place where Robert's rules and the state statutes differ. According to Robert's rules, you don't record in the minutes who made the second, but according to state statute, you are required to record who made the second. Then, Sarah, do you allow any discussion before there's a second? No. Well, that, that's, yeah, that's- Andy? Me. No. I was gonna, I would no. say technically no, but there are times where it does happen. Right. Where somebody will have a, you know, and, and Roberts addresses that, you know, by saying if, you know, it should presume that if there is discussion and after one single person votes, that it's presumed that the motion has been seconded, but then I don't know how that, that works with the requirement in statute that we record that there's a second. Yeah, and let Thoughts me just, on that, Andy? Yeah, just let me take you back to that chart that Sarah had with eight boxes, all right? As the boxes, as the motion, as a business moves through each of those boxes, understand that the motion begins with the maker. It's the maker's motion at that point. When the maker is done speaking, done making the motion, nothing happens unless there's a second. Once there's a second, that motion belongs to the chair. The chair restates the motion to make sure it's clear to the body. 
Once that restatement occurs, it's the body's motion. Doesn't belong to the maker, doesn't belong to the person who seconded, doesn't belong to the chair. So if we think it that way, about it that way, as the business or the motion, who it belongs to as you go through the process, that helps in understanding all of those various steps and elements that Sarah talked about. Quick. Thanks, Andy. Mr. Howick. Real quick question. I just want to clarify, on abstention, um, does, do we have to state the reason why we want to abstain? What are your board rules? Andy, I think that the board rule, you did say their board rule requires that, right? I, de I defer to the board rule, and I, I know I've talked to Rebecca about this, so she knows, I know that, but um, I don't recall off the top of my head whether the board rule requires the reason or not. I'd, I'd have to take a look at that. Go ahead, Mr. Hoff. Uh, yeah, in the board rules, it states that a member with a conflict of interest shall not vote, and prior to the matter being debated, seek authority from the chair to abstain. Yeah, and so there you go. I would prefer, I, so the rule doesn't state explicitly that you have to give the reason, but I would prefer you to. I think that it's helpful if we understand what the nature of the conflict is, to make sure there's nothing that we have to do to otherwise alleviate the conflict concern. So um, I think that it's a great policy that it happens before debate because then we may ask the person to exit the room, completely absent themselves from the, from the debate. Um, and without understanding the reason why somebody is abstaining, it's kind of hard to make that determination. Andy, yeah, you're right. You just referenced something I was gonna ask you to address is, you know, once you do declare that you need to abstain and you have a conflict of interest, I was going to ask you to address whether or not you should leave the room and complete so that you are completely, you know, out of, out of the discussion, whether you, you know, even if you stay in the room, you could in unintentionally make some, you know, facial expressions or something that that may lead folks to know where, where you where you may land on the issue. So I don't know yeah, if you want to address it. that. Yeah, wear your yeah, mask, I, you're I, good. Over the past 25 years, I've seen you make plenty of facial expressions at me, Sarah, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Schleter. I guess I would suggest that there should be a reason shared with the chair so that the reason for abstention is to create a lack of a quorum and therefore kill a motion. Is that a proper way of looking at it? Did you hear that, Andy? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. There are certain circumstances in statute where it's a majority vote or some supermajority vote of all supervisors entitled to a seat to pass, but let's think about that for a minute. Even if we've got a committee of, you know, five and we have three people all of a sudden abstain, somebody might say, well, now you can't get the three votes to pass. Well, if it's just a simple majority, all you need is two in that circumstance, okay? So it kind of depends as it relates to abstentions, negating a quorum or otherwise defeating a particular measure, but I think it is always good practice to disclose the nature of the conflict and have a discussion about it. Thank you. Okay. All right, other good. questions on that? Because I know that was one of the items that, that we were asked to address when we were here. So, all right, and I am mindful of the time. I have looked at the time. Andy, you probably need 30 to 40 minutes, I'm guessing, to deal with the other couple of issues. So what I think I'm gonna do here is just, you know, we went through the parliamentary procedure stuff. The rest of the stuff that I have included in this section is all, you know, um, you know, rules of decorum, things that I think folks typically understand in terms of making sure that, you know, you are addressing the chair that, you know, again, some of these are in Roberts, avoid using the use of member names. Although, you know, I think a lot of times we, you know, people in county board meetings do call each other by, by first name, and that's perfectly fine. Robert suggests you not do that, but you know, I think every single board, county board meeting I've been at, I don't think I've been to a single one where they have referenced the supervisor from the 14th district or you know, like they do in the legislature. I don't think I've seen that in a single county board meeting 
we already talked a bit about the board, you know, chair, you know, even through roles and responsibilities, that discussion and some of this parliamentary procedure stuff about the, the role of the chair, um, you know, how we work things in committee, uh, motions and misconceptions. I don't think we're really talking about, you know, a lot of nominations or elections going on right now. A um, couple of things, I, I will just talk about probably the two biggest uh, questions we get, and then I'll turn it over to Andy. One of them talks about the motion to lay on the table. A lot of times that's one of the motions that is, is most often misused. A lot of times people think if you make a motion to lay on the table, it means you're gonna bring it up at, a, at, a, at another meeting. In essence, the motion to lay on the table really means that you're temporarily setting that item aside with an intent of taking it up later within that same meeting. If you wish to take up a, a motion, uh, an item at another meeting, the proper motion to make would be the motion to postpone to a time certain. Sometimes also people will use tabling as a motion to try to kill something. The appropriate motion to kill something is not to table it, but instead the appropriate motion there would be to postpone indefinitely. So that's one thing that we know we get a lot of questions on or things, you know, and, and again, if you watch the legislature, I never see the legislature make the motion to indefinitely postpone. They always make the motion to table. So don't watch what the legislature does because they follow their own set of rules that they make up on their own. So they're a really bad example of, of what you guys should, should do. And I could say that in, 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 in respect to many, many of things, I guess. Um, all right, so we talked about postpone and definitely postpone. We already talked about moving the previous question. The other thing I told you I would get to is friendly amendment. And that gets to that whole motion of, uh, of you know, somebody saying, you know, hey, can I just make a friendly amendment to that motion to, you know, say it's a really red truck. Now, somebody who, I, who I've, I've worked with at Extension for years always says, amendments have no sentiments, meaning there's no such thing as a friendly amendment. Because again, that gets to that notion of the, once the chair restates the motion, the motion belongs to the body. Meaning you can't go back to the maker in the second and say, hey, Will you, would you, are, you guys, are you too open to a friendly amendment to put the word really in front of red? We see that happen all the time. But again, there's really no such thing as a friendly amendment. Now to get around having to make a motion in a second to, to make what most people think would be a friendly amendment and something that nobody would, would object to, then the chair could ask for unanimous consent to make that change. But it, instead of, but you can't ask the maker in the second because the motion no longer belongs to them. So you would likely do that through unanimous consent. Other than that, I think that is it. Are you making a point of order now? Yes, he is. All right, point of order, point of order, Andy. So point of order. If, if somebody believes and feels that, that the rules of the assembly are being violated, so for example, if they believe that somebody is speaking out of turn or speaking out of order, not following you know, the, the, your county board rules, not following the procedures as established within your county board rules, somebody can stand up at any time and just say, point of order. Um, it's an order to make when somebody has the floor. You don't need to wait for the chair to call on you to raise a point of order. It doesn't require a second. A point of order is not debatable. Instead, uh, you, you know, the chair will, you, you, you raised, you say, I want a point of order. The chair will recognize you. You will state what your point of order is. And then the chair makes a determination as to whether or not your point of order is indeed in order or whether or not it's out of order. And the chair would, this. you know, take a look at, go ahead, Andy. What happens if the chair doesn't know? What if the chair's like, boy, that's a good question. I don't know. From a parliamentary uh, standpoint, I don't know. Well, I was going to get to that, Andy. Go for I'll it. get to that, right? Is that where that corporation council comes into play? I think so. You know, yeah. coming from the attorney, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. No, <laughs> that's an important point, though, is that the chair can't be expected to be Henry Robert himself sitting in that chair. The chair is to run the meeting. The chair isn't to be the expert in parliamentary procedure. So take your time as the chair of a point of order is raised. Understand what the point of order is. Ask your parliamentarian, you know, that's a good role for corporation council, ask your parliamentarian, 
How does Robert's rules deal with this? How do the county board rules deal with this? And then the chair makes a determination. What happens if the body disagrees with the chair? Somebody suggested it's a two thirds vote, Andy. No, no, it's, it's a majority vote by the body. Motion to overrule the chair's decision. And then it's a simple majority. Of the body. Yep. yep. Yeah, just, you know, in terms of, we have these little cards that, that we have made available. It's also in your county uh, board handbook. That, that we provided to everybody as well right after the election. There's a page in there that is basically this card that lets you know, you know, does something require a second? Is it debatable? Can it be amended? And what type of vote does it take? Is it a majority vote or is it a two thirds vote? So you guys should have this with you, um, you know, to help you through the meetings to make sure you are making the appropriate motions at the appropriate times and that we're disposing of the, mo the motions in, in the appropriate manner. So again, so just this last slide, because Andy is so proud of the work that he did. Um, we did include in here because we did go through this very quickly. On March 29th, we did hold an educational seminar called Out of Order, Parliamentary Procedure Basics for Effective and Efficient Meetings, put on by Andy Phillips. And so if you guys are looking for additional information, curious about some of the slides we didn't get to tonight, you can just pull up the link. It's on our, it's on our website. Um, you know, probably the easiest way to get it is go to our website, go to events, go under past events, and you'll find a whole bunch of information, um, you know, and, uh, you know, educational webinars on, you know, lots of topics, whether it's parliamentary procedure. I think all of our county officials workshops ones are on there too. So we have things on there related to open meetings, public records, agendas and minutes, uh, roles and responsibilities, all of those things. So it's a good resource to go to if you're looking for additional information on any of this stuff. Hey, sir, are With we going to do a follow-up on that, Parley Pro, too? Are we doing a follow-up on that? Yes, we are. We are, Andy. You and I just need to get together and pick a date and time. Uh, there was a lot of questions on that webinar that we were unable to get to. And so what we thought we'd do is schedule a follow-up in more of a town hall format, meaning that, you know, we'll play Stumpy Andy Phillips, right? at that particular one, see if we can stump them. And we really, you know, there was a lot of questions folks asked that weren't, you know, particularly about parliamentary procedure as well. A lot of them interplay with, you know, the open meetings law and all these other things too. And so we said, you know, we just, there was no way we could cover everything in an hour on, on parliamentary procedure and get to everybody's questions. So we are gonna do a follow-up. We'll get information out to everybody on that as well. It'll be a place where, you know, I don't think we intend to have a formal presentation other than, you know, to have folks just prepper Andy with questions uh, with regard to parliamentary procedure and, and, you know, I'm sure other topics as well. It'll be fun. It will come up. Okay. All right, Andy, you are up for the rest of this. So, right, so we got a half I'm hour to turn off my bit. microphone and just work these slides. All right. Thanks, Sarah. It, it, we're going to work through quite a bit here on the open meetings law. Um, I want you to understand, all right, when we talk about foundation, we set the table when we were talking about roles and responsibilities, and we do other things as it relates to the open meetings law. And when we set the table for the open meetings law, understand that there is a very, very strong public policy in this state that meetings of governmental bodies are going to be open to the public. We, ha we have a very, very strong inclination within the Wisconsin statutes in our state's history, in everything that says government business ought to be transparent, okay? So we want to provide the public with the most information to allow them to observe what it is that their government is doing. Next slide. So to whom does the open meetings law apply? That's an important question. The statute tells us it's a state or local agency, board, commission, committee, council, department, or public body, corporate, and politic created by constitution, statute, ordinance, rule, or order, all right? That's a very broad definition, all right? But sometimes we don't know whether a particular group of people is going to constitute a government body. After all, ask the question, if Supervisor Schleter hosts four other supervisors 
at his home to watch the Packer game if three of those four are on a committee with Mr. Schleter. Is that a committee meeting? I mean, if you look at the definition here, do we have a governmental body meeting in Mr. Schleter's home to watch the Packer game? We'll get into that in a little bit. Next slide. Just post the meeting prior. So <laughs> when we talk about who, to whom does the law apply, you have to look at the method of creation. And this was a case that went up to the Supreme Court three or four years ago, um, dealing with the Krieger versus Appleton area school district case, where they dealt with the concept of an ad hoc, it was basically a curriculum committee comprised of teachers and staff and others and that group got together and went through the ninth grade reading list for English class on the various books to determine what that list of approved books for ninth grade English was going to be. It was just essentially a bunch of people writing book reports about these books. Well, ultimately, the Supreme Court said that's a committee and that's a governmental body that's subject to the open meetings law. And the reason that the Supreme Court reached that conclusion is because within the school board policies, this whole concept of a curriculum committee, similar to what this other committee did, exists within those policies. So that's why I tell people, pay particular attention to your county board rules, pay particular attention to your ordinances, your personnel policies, any other official policy from the county board, because if any of those policies, the resolutions, the, the personnel policies, if anything talks about the creation of, of a committee that looks like what's being created, a court more likely than not is gonna find it to be a governmental body subject to the open meetings law. Next slide. So we know composition wise, who needs to be there in order for it to be a meeting in terms of source of authority, but what is a meeting? I mean, honestly, is meeting to watch a Packer game at Supervisor Schleter's house, is that the type of meeting we're talking about? Well, the answer to that is no, that when we look at the definition in the statutes, a meeting is convening of members for the purpose of exercising the responsibilities, authority, powers or duties delegated to or vested in the body. So a bunch of supervisors gathering at, at Mr. Schleter's house to watch the Packer game, they're not there for an official Sawyer County purpose. So that's not a meeting under the open meetings law. Next. So what satisfies the statutory definitions? It was in the Showers case, State X Royal Newspapers versus Showers. I always call it the two P's test, people and purpose, all right? Number one, if there are enough people gathered in one spot to constitute a quorum of any sort of official body of the governmental entity, and those people are there for a purpose of discussing governmental uh, business, it's gonna be a meeting. Those, those are the two P's, people and purpose. Next slide. So when we talk about purpose, what are we talking about? Well, if you look at the Showers case, it refers to any formal or informal action, including discussion, decision, or information gathering on matters within the governmental body's realm of authority. And that's where it gets tricky because the Showers court used this concept of informal action or information gathering. And that's where we, honestly, the open meetings law gets expanded beyond what I think the original legislative intent was. That aside for a moment, it's the law, so we got to deal with it. In this state actual Bagkey versus Green Dove Village board case is really what illuminated this. What happened in Bagkey is that you had village board members attending a different meeting, and I believe it was at the city council, um, because the city council action was going to impact something that the village was ultimately going to have to act on. So they wanted to find out what was the city going to do. They wanted to listen to what the public was saying to the city in the public comment period. They wanted to hear the deliberations by the city council. So they all got together and went to the meeting. They didn't discuss anything. They didn't take any formal action, but they listened to what the city council was doing. The court said you had to notice that meeting. That's an official meeting of the village board, okay? So that's where it gets dangerous. And that's where I think, again, the open meetings law was expanded beyond its intended purpose because in my estimation, if you are a diligent county board supervisor and you're investing the time necessary to do a good job, that's what I talked about earlier, you're gonna to wanna to get to a lot of these meetings to understand what business is proceeding before various committees so that when you get to the county board floor, you have an understanding of exactly what issues are being presented and what the pros and cons and merits and all this other stuff, you saw all of it at the committee level. 
and that's awesome. But here we have the Supreme Court telling us that you shouldn't do that, or if you do, you have to notice an official meeting. And that's where, again, there's a bit of a tension within the open meetings laws that relates to good government versus transparency to the public. Next slide. Here we get into number of members present requirement. We get into concepts like negative quorum and walking quorum. A negative quorum is the number of people necessary to defeat a measure. Most, the clearest example that I can provide is it takes two thirds vote to amend your county budget. So in that circumstance, a negative quorum is anything more than one third of the board. It's not half the board, it's one third of the board because if that one third agree to act in concert, they can defeat a budget amendment, okay? It's also important to remember what constitutes a negative quorum or for that matter, a quorum for purposes of taking action. Earlier, when we were discussing parliamentary procedure, I gave you the example of a five person committee. How many people out of that five person committee is a negative quorum? Somebody give me a number. You're saying two, Andy. It is, it's two. That's absolutely right. Two people acting in concert can defeat anything. So that doesn't mean if all five people vote that two people can defeat something, but what if you have two abstentions or one abstention? And so there are only four people eligible to vote. So again, you have to understand that the negative quorum number is not necessarily just more than half. It is whatever is necessary to defeat a particular proposal. Next slide. Walking quorums. All right, so when we look at the definition of walking quorum, and this is again in the Showers case, walking quorum is defined as a series of gatherings among separate groups of members of a governmental body, each less than quorum size, who agree tacitly or explicitly to act uniformly in sufficient number to reach a quorum. Okay, so that's a pretty good definition. Somebody, and I can't wait until somebody can do this, somebody tell me the difference between the definition of a walking quorum and politics. What's the difference? There is no difference, all right? This is politics. And so I can sit here on this Zoom call, Sarah can stand before you, we talk with other county boards around the state, and we sit there with a smile on our face and say, the only time you should be discussing county business is within the walls of the courthouse or the highway shop or the sheriff's office in the context of an official meeting of the board or a committee. That's the only time you should be discussing county business. And all sorts of heads are nodding and saying, yep, that's exactly how we do it around here. And within 30 seconds of leaving the meeting, Sarah and I always see somebody violating that rule. All right? So as a lawyer, I'm supposed to tell you, you have to comply with the law. As a person, I know that you're not always going to. So be mindful of the law, be mindful of the fact that people are watching, and to the extent possible, if you're going to discuss county business, do it with not a quorum, not a negative quorum. It's okay to have a one-on-one -on -one with another supervisor, but don't turn that into a six, seven, eight-person gathering, okay? Try to avoid politics as much as possible. All right, next slide. Next slide, we can talk about this. We're, we're trying to buzz through this a little bit here. Petitions, it's okay to have a petition circulated asking for a county board meeting and providing the topic of the meeting. It's not okay to circulate a petition asking people how are they, how are they going to vote on a particular measure that's going to come before the county board. That's an important distinction because I get this asked a lot and I'm sure Sarah does too. Is it a violation of the walking quorum rules to sign a petition that says we're going to have something on the agenda for a meeting? No, that's not a violation of the walking quorum rules. What is a violation is if that petition also indicates, indicate whether you're going to vote yes or no on this, okay? Next slide. So we have technological advances. You know, 20 years ago, it would have been very difficult for me to zoom into the Sawyer County Board meeting. Now I have the ability to be there live and in color in real time while I'm sitting in my son's room in the basement of my home in Cedar Park, Wisconsin. Pretty cool. Allows us to meet on a moment's notice and do different things. Well, there are dangers associated with that. And I'm just gonna cover the next couple of slides here very quickly. 
We have telephone conferences, video conferences, Zoom technology, all sorts of other issues that creep their way into the open meetings discussion, even though the law was written before any of this technology existed, all right? So we're trying to graft current technology onto a law that's been around for a long, long time. It doesn't always fit well, it doesn't always mesh, all right? You've seen a lot of guidance come out of the Attorney General's office in the last 13 months dealing with remote communication and open meetings law. I would encourage you to, uh, to visit DOJ's website to get information about how the Attorney General views compliance in this age of digital communication. We, WCA, have put on webinars and had discussions dealing with open meetings law compliance in a remote environment and things of that nature. So I would encourage all of you at some point to take a look at those resources to have an understanding of how the open meetings law intersects with all these technological advances. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. All right, this is, this is the fun one. All right, Sarah, we're gonna stay here for a moment. The stuff that you see on the right are actual text messages exchanged between alders at the City of Madison Council meeting where when they were meeting, a resourceful reporter noticed that whenever an item of business was before the city council, all the council members didn't have their heads up and were looking at people and engaging in debate. They had their phone and they were sitting there with their face in the phone and they saw thumbs moving. And so what did the reporter do? What does every good reporter do in that circumstance? Sarah, what do you think the reporter did? Made an open records request for those text Bingo. messages. Bingo, bingo. So are those text messages public records? Yes, they are. So the reporter got them. And so the reporter was able to publish the text of all of those text messages that went back and forth between the council members, all right? So not only is it a public records issue because it's embarrassing to have to turn over your phone to give somebody all of those text messages, but it's an open meetings law issue because again, we're talking about what should be an official debate open to the public and it wasn't. So just be careful. Technology is awesome, but you have to be very, very careful how you use it. Next slide. Recording. Anybody who wants to record you can do so. They can record you by audio means. They can report, record you by video means. As long as- Andy, we care. have a question. Hold on. We have a question, right. Andy. Ahead, I'm sorry. Bennett. My question is, uh, how is that possible, like private phones, if, if that is a, a company issued phone or issued through the, the county, I can understand that, or I have my personal computer right here. Um, how is that possible that someone could get that through the open meetings if that has nothing to do with anything and that's my private computer? Well, I mean, the short answer is if, if it has nothing to do with uh, the county or the county's business, they're not going to get it. But what happened in a case in California, it's not happened in Wisconsin, but there was a case in California where somebody made that same argument. Hey, look, county doesn't pay for my cell phone. And so I'm doing whatever I want on here and you're not getting access to it. Court disagreed. Court said, we have seen significant evidence suggesting that you are conducting county business on that phone. So you gotta turn that phone over and allow us as a court and as parties to this litigation to download the information that relates to county business. Not good. And so I think it's awesome if we have a personal phone and we use it for personal reasons or we have a business issued phone, we use it only for that business reason. But as soon as you start conducting county business on there, understand that it could be open to, to inspection. Not saying it will be, just saying it could be, all right? That's another reason why I always tell counties, issue county email addresses and conduct all county business through the county email address. Because what's really, really nice is when you get a, a public records request for all emails that you sent and received during a specific date period, and you can simply turn to your IT department and say, hey, can you download those messages and fulfill the request? Because if that comes in, if that request comes in and you've been making all sorts of emails on your phone or on your personal computer, guess what? It's on you to have to comply with that records request. So 
use county systems for county business. That's the simplest way to explain it. Uh, I talked about recordings. Next slide. Who gets to close a meeting? It's, it belongs to the committee. It belongs to the body. Somebody cannot demand a closed session. The body has the right to close that meeting. All right, so understand that the committee holds that power. Next slide. Next slide. There's all the reasons that you can close a meeting to the public. Any questions? I think I've explained it pretty thoroughly with that slide. Any questions? I was of course teasing. Of course there are questions about closed session. We're not gonna get into all of those reasons. That's another reason when you look at that previous slide with everything that's in there with all of those words, understand that under each one of those reasons, there is a whole bunch of case law interpreting those words. Understand that the Attorney General's Compliance Guide for Open Meetings Law runs, I don't know, 80 some single space pages. So this isn't easy stuff. It's not on you to be able to interpret, understand, and apply all of these exemptions. Who's it on? It's on your Corporation Council. This is another area where you need to lean heavily on Corporation Council for advice about open meetings law compliance, all right? So just understand that these exemptions are out there. You can go into closed session, but really, really lean on Corporation Council to give you the advice necessary to make sure you're doing it in the appropriate way. Next slide. Next slide. So I've left 12 minutes to get through ethics and conflicts of interest because I know everybody, everybody showed up tonight waiting to hear about ethics and conflicts of interest. Before I move there, any questions on open meetings? Yeah, hey Andy, this is Jesse Betcher. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just got to, if you can clarify on the walking forum, um, does that re also apply to emails? Like, uh, hypothetically, if, if all the board members get an email from the administrator, Tom Hoff, and then I'm going to comment or, or answer the question or whatever, and I hit reply all, would that constitute uh, a walking quorum? Potentially, yeah. Potentially it could, because that's the danger with the reply to all feature is that all of a sudden you've created real-time communication on a matter that is either pending or anticipated before the governmental body. So I would avoid that reply to all feature. I understand that there is occasion to get information out to all of the supervisors. So Mr. Hoff may send out an email about something. Just avoid the reply to all and don't do that. Or if you're going to ask Mr. Hoff about particular elements associated with his communication, just pick up the phone and call him. Um, that's the best way to avoid that. But yes, it does. the walking quorum rules apply to electronic communications. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, ethics and conflict of interest. This is a great quote here, and I think we have another one in, on the slide that follows. There's no order so bad as that which arises from goodness tainted. Thoreau said that. Next slide. Warren Buffett said it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. Now, the reason we put these slides in here is that neither of those are law. Neither of those are principles of law that you need to memorize and understand but it underscores the importance of the discussion about ethics and conflicts of interest. Understand that this is a very, very serious issue. We had the discussion earlier about identifying conflict of interest, which is going to cause uh, abstention, cause you to abstain from voting. Um, there's a reason that we want to treat that very seriously. And the reason is because we don't want anybody's reputation to be harmed. We don't want to violate the law. We don't want others to get into hot water because of a potential conflict of interest. We certainly don't want to negate the business that's before the county board or a county board committee. So these are very, very important features in the law. And again, you'll see that there is a significant role for legal in this circumstance. As I'll mention later, legal is going to give you your get out of jail free card. The beauty of ethics is that if you go to legal, and say, here's my situation, what should I do? And corporation counsel says, I think you should do X, Y, and Z. As long as you do X, Y, and Z, you can't be held individually responsible if it's later determined that you engaged in an unethical, under the statutes, an unethical activity 
or took a particular action that you couldn't take under 19.59 of the statutes. So I can't stress enough, always talk with corporation counsel when issues like this arise, all right? Next slide, it applies to uh, this code of ethics in 19.59 of the statute. It applies to counties, no question about that. It applies to county supervisors, no question about that. It applies to your county administrator, no question about that. It does not apply to all employees in the county, all right? That's an important distinction. When we talk about application of an ethics code to county employees, that would have to be a local code. So if Sawyer County has its own ethics code, it can make it apply to employees, but the law does not require it. Next slide. Next. All right, so there are various categories of prohibited conduct under 19.59 of the statutes dealing with the code of ethics applicable to local public officials, all right? An official can't use his or her public position or office to obtain financial gain or anything of substantial value for him or herself, his or her immediate family, or an organization with which he or she is associated. Now, I wanna talk about a couple of definitional points in here, because this sounds really good. This sounds beautiful. And I think everybody would agree, yeah, this is bad stuff. Why would anybody ever do this? Well, what is substantial value? $5, $50, $500, what does that mean? Well, thankfully, the ethics board has given us some guidance and put this arbitrary line at $25. I don't even know if that's the right line to draw. We don't have any court case that tells us where that line is drawn. We just have guidance from the state ethics board. So substantial value in your mind, think $25 or more, that's substantial value. Next, immediate family. A lot of people misconstrue this definition of immediate family. A lot of people think that just because Mr. Schumann's brother is involved with a particular issue before the county board, that Mr. Schumann is precluded by the ethics code from taking a vote or engaging in debate. That's not true, all right? Unless Mr. Schumann's brother receives 50% or more of his support from Mr. Schumann, or Mr. Schumann receives 50% or more of his support from his brother, that is not the immediate family relationship, okay? So it's an economically defined relationship that defines immediate family with the exception of spouse, all right? Spouse is automatically in there. So understand that if we go to the previous slide quick, Sarah, because I'm gonna rattle through these. When we're talking about the prohibitions in the ethics code, you can see this terminology quite a bit. Anything of substantial value and immediate family, understand those. that's how those terms are defined. Next slide. Second category of prohibited conduct. You can't offer or give to a public official directly or indirectly, and you as a public official cannot solicit or accept from any person directly or directly anything of value if it would be expected to influence your judgment or your vote. This is the bribery thing, all right? You can't take that. You can't take $500 under the table to vote for something. It seems pretty, it seems pretty um, self-describing. It, it's, it's obvious you shouldn't do this, but remember there's a lot of gray area in there. So if you have a vendor, for example, that all of a sudden the night before the big county board vote on whether to award the contract wants to take you out to a huge steak dinner, a night on the town and buys you a motorcycle, Hmm, I wonder why they're doing all those things. Do they reasonably anticipate that you're going to vote for the contract? So you got to start thinking about these things. Next slide. Pay to play. That's another prohibition. No public official or candidate may directly or by means of an agent offer or promise to give or withhold an offer or promise to withhold the vote or influence or promise to refrain from taking official action. Da, da, da. You can't do the pay to play stuff. It's the same as in a similar category as the one we just talked about. Next slide. Conflicting interests. Take any matter substantially affecting a matter in which you or your family or an organization with which you're involved has a substantial financial interest. You can't use your position in a way that produces 
that sort of benefit or influence. Next. An interpretive exception, this class action rule. All right, so if you're gonna take action, let's imagine that one of the board supervisor's spouses works for the county and you have a budget that is presented to the board for approval, which calls for a 2% across the board raise for all county employees. Can you take action on that budget because your spouse happens to be an employee of the county and happens to be in the class of people that is gonna receive a 2% raise? Yes, you can because your spouse is situated similarly to all other county employees so you can take that action. Next. Next. Enforcement. Here's where the rubber meets the road. What happens if? What happens if you violate? You'd be subject to a forfeiture of not more than a grand for each violation, all right? There is an, a, a crime associated with political contributions, but it's $1,000 for each violation. The real problem is that number one, you have to pay a forfeiture potentially that comes out of your personal pocket. Number two, the county might have to pay the attorney fees of the attorney prosecuting you for the ethics violation. Three, you have to pay your own lawyer. And so up and down the line, you're shelling out money. And then when it gets to the final result, the court may void whatever business transaction led to the ethics issue. So you're gonna get the advantage of the business relationship to boot. So it can get ugly as it relates to enforcement of the ethics code. Next. There's your get out of jail free card, all right? You can get an advisory opinion through Corporation Council. If you follow the advice the Corporation Council gives you, you're not gonna be found responsible. Next. I don't wanna talk about incompatibility, sir. I just wanna to get to the statutes 946.12 and 946.13 dealing with criminal conduct. Understand that some conflicts of interest, ethics issues are so bad that they're considered felonies with a capital F, that's bad stuff. They're considered felonies under the law. I don't have the time to get into the analysis of these statutes, but it is pretty simple to get into hot water under these statutes. I wanna make that point because again, I can't emphasize enough the need to make sure you get good legal advice as it relates to potential conflicts of interest and ethics questions. Because beyond that $1,000 forfeiture issue and all of the negative ramifications that come with it, you might be charged with a crime and it's a felony, so it can get ugly. So with that, Sarah, I mean, I'm speed talking like crazy here and not doing these topics full justice. So let me stop here and ask if there are questions or comments as it relates to open meetings, ethics, conflicts of interest, whatever. Nobody here, is there anybody online that has questions? I do, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, go ahead. Mr. Phillips, you stated we should rely on our corporation council and we're talking about ethics and conflicts. Uh, you work for Von Brees and who's our corporation council? Or I think it depends on the circumstances. I know that we provide legal counsel to the county Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure what that question was or how I was supposed to answer it. So I'm happy to clarify if anybody has other questions. Yep. Anybody else? Nope, I don't think so, Andy. Great. If you have follow up questions or comments, um, feel free to reach out to me, reach out to Sarah. I will note, Sarah, as she was flipping through the slides, there was there are two slides in there, and I know you've got copies of this. There are two slides that are called smell test. Um, and those questions are designed to, if you answer yes to any of them, to identify potential ethics issues, all right? So if you're thinking about something and it just doesn't smell right, take a look at the smell test. And if you answer yes to any of the questions that are in that series, that should trigger a, a, a desire on your part to go have a discussion with Corporation Council um, and try to figure out whether this is a situation where recusal might be required or some other action is required. I like the smell test because again, I, I think it's relatively easy to understand and I think it hits all of the points within 19.59 and 946.13 that I discussed.
Okay, thank you, Andy. Sarah, do you have anything else to add? I have nothing else to add other than thank you so much for the invitation to come up here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Happy this. to come up, happy to come up again. The drive actually isn't bad. Be better if it wasn't raining today. <laughs> right. I'll say, but it beats snow, no yeah. doubt about it. And again, yeah. as Andy said, if you guys have follow-up questions, please, please, you know, get a hold of one of us um, and we'll definitely get get an answer back to you. Oh, Andy, are you still on, Andy? Still, yeah, Andy's still here. Right. I can see him. I am still here, yes. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. It's great to hear everybody, see everybody um, like this. At some point, I'll make it up there in person, but it's great to see everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm yeah, Mr. Mr. Schleter has a question for you, though. Andy? Yes. I would never invite four county board members to my place to watch a Packer game. I couldn't afford the beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay any other questions from the board yeah mr chairman i have a question i know we're over our two hour limit but uh i have a yep, question ahead, for, mr. Sarah, Metric. for uh sarah dietrich um back in roles and responsibilities you mentioned that the board as a body can sue and also uh be sued i'm just wondering if you could give an example, either a real or hypothetical, of an example where we as a board could be sued. I'm going to leave that to the, the lawyer. I am not a lawyer. Andy, you want to cover that one? You must have yeah, a sample. Yeah, a county is a body corporate. Can a board get sued? Theoretically, yes. The way a board gets sued is there are actions called certiorari and mandamus, which are fancy Latin terms for causes of action in a court of law that either require a county board to do something which under the law it's required to do or uh, the county board has made a decision that under the law is inappropriate so somebody might sue the county board to have that decision decision either overturned or force the county board into a position where it's required to perform a duty required by law um, Typically, you see the Board of Supervisors named in those types of actions. I've seen Boards of Supervisors named in other types of actions. I think that the real proper name should be in the name of the county, but there are circumstances where it is the Board of Supervisors that's named because, again, that's the body that's being asked to take a certain action. Okay, I was just kind of questioning if we could be liable for like an accident with a with a county uh, no. you know, a county vehicle or something like that. Nope, 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 nope. That's the county's responsibility. There's a statute on the books, 895.46 of the statutes. That statute says in very simple terms, as long as you do everything that you're supposed to do and don't purposefully go outside the boundaries of being a county board supervisor, engage in what they call willful misconduct, the county has to indemnify you. So even if you get sued individually, even if the board gets named, the county has to indemnify you for any legal claim. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. Okay, thank you everyone. With that, then we are adjourned. Mr. Chairman. Whoa, yep. I've been sitting here with my hand raised as I, as I always am. And my question was, <laughs> Sorry, Ms. Pettit, go ahead. If we are going to get a copy of this presentation, a slide presentation, emailed to us so we can go over it. For us that were, I, I, I didn't get anything. Yes, the, the, the county clerk does have a copy that she can email to you. And, and we do have um, printed copies as well. And, we, and I did bring enough printed copies for those of you. So I'm, I assume they'll be in your mailbox or how, whatever processes your county uses to get that to you as well. Yeah, Madam Clerk is not a grad. Thank you. Is Thank that you, good, sir. Ms. Pettit? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Could I get her? Yeah. Mr. Schumann, can I get the time she attended? I didn't have her on a roll call. 607. I couldn't get on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, everyone.